Now we will grow, go from the broader perspective and, and towards a more specific example of joint EU research. Uh, Elisabetta Vignotti uh, will provide an important example on applied science as part of Arctic policy and hence the importance of scientific support and input. Elisabeth Vignati is a scientist uh, within the field of black carbon and she is here as head of Air and Climate Unit, uh, Institute for Environment and Sustainability, Joint Research Center of the European Commission. Elisabetta, the stage is yours. So, Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It, <clears throat> it's really an honor being here and having the possibility to explain or share with you which is uh, the, uh, the, the scientific support that we are doing in the Commission, the, the direct scientific support to the policy of the EU. And I wanted to start uh, also from all the information and the, the, the whole uh, bunch of information that you have received also in, uh, in uh, our colleague presentation and going specifically to the work that we do practically in, in terms of the scientific support. I work at the Joint Research Centre. We are uh, a DG, a D a Directorate General of the European Commission, and particularly is a, a peculiar Directorate General because it's not one of the, the Directorate General that uh, writes or work on the policies, but we are the one inside of the Commission that uh, can provide the scientific and technical uh, uh, support to that. So we are not doing uh, basic science, we are doing uh, applied science, and particularly in those fields that are of relevance for the EU policy. We do the same uh, in some of the areas that, are to do, that have to do with the, with the policy in the Arctic. And particularly what we have done and what we are currently doing is actively participating in the work of some of the task forces and the working groups of the Arctic Counseling. A council following what was uh, so clearly uh, written in the documents that they were prepared by the European uh, Parliament and the Council on the uh, engagement, the active engagement of the EU institutions inside of the Arctic Council. But also we carry out also scientific activities that are of interest of the EU uh, policy and I'm going to show uh, a few examples of them. The first thing I want to tell you is uh, the work that we have been doing uh, in, in the last couple of years, working inside of the task forces and the work uh, groups of the Arctic Council. And uh, I am really happy to share here my personal experience because I worked myself representing the EU in the task force on, uh, for action on black carbon and methane. And then uh, I think that uh, what we had in mind uh, was uh, really that uh, our role there was really to announce the, the dialogue uh, between the Arctic Council and the European Union. And we did uh, throughout uh, the, the, the time that we were engaged in the task force and, uh, and also recently in uh, the, our engagement, uh, particularly in the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. Um, of course, when you participate in such a scientific forum, although in this interface between science and policy, you need to have also some scientific expertise and scientific credibility to do that. So we have scientific projects, we have developing expertise in some of the fields for quite some years now, and we are covering a field, fields going from climate change, marine and maritime issues, uh, energy, and the environment also. I want to start uh, showing what is uh, the work that is uh, mostly related also to the work done uh, inside, uh, and uh, that has to do with the black carbon, in particular the short-lived climate forces, which are also one of the issues that are of importance and, and under this uh, US uh, chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Particularly, we are looking at the, the links between uh, the melting of the ice and also the atmospheric processes that are happening, try to reconstruct the processes that are giving rise to such a tremendous uh, uh, increase of temperature that we see. We also look at the interaction also with those uh, short-lived climate forces, particularly the black carbon, and try to understand how this is really related with this uh, pattern in the transport and also with the ice uh, melting. 
Starting from uh, uh, studies that has been done also in the past, uh, also by all uh, the international community, we recognize also the importance of the effect of the climate change on the vegetation and the ecosystem uh, in, in the Arctic regions. And it is clearly seen that there is a quite an increase of the vegetation and also a change of the vegetation due to the increase of the temperature. So we dedicate also some of the work in order to evaluate which are the models that they are used for the prediction and try to evaluate them also with observation and try to reconcile also the observations that are done in situ and in the satellite. And this is also to help the, this modeling in their predicting capacity to improve those. We also look at the oceans and looking at the, the quality of the water as well as uh, the state of the impact on the uh, ecosystems uh, that they are of marine nature. And we look, uh, for instance, uh, of uh, the fingerprint of uh, the, uh, the rivers uh, going uh, out and outflowing also the organic map, uh, mass matter that we see in this picture as well as uh, the, the amount of, uh, of phytoplankton that is present. Not only we evaluate uh, also in the Arctic, what is the primary production, which is also an important matter, but we believe that all this is very useful when you make an assessment of the state of the biodiversity in the sea as well, and also to try to evaluate the impact on the ecosystems. Uh, we heard uh, many times uh, during these days uh, that there is uh, really a need, that there are a lot of information <clears throat> and data outside uh, that need somewhat, some, somehow to be also gathered together and made them available. So um, one of the, these uh, tools that has been uh, developed uh, is uh, the Arctic Blue Hub. And then uh, you find there also where to find uh, this uh, hub. And uh, this uh, Arctic uh, Blue Hub is meant uh, to uh, gather all the information that they have to do with the <coughs> ships and then uh, particularly the art observation and also which are the tracking system of these uh, ships. In this way, not only we know what is happening, but it's really the, the way to be able to produce also a policy that makes also sense. And it also a place where all this information can be really gathered together. We have also an activity that has to do with the offshore oil and gas, and particularly we follow the directive that, uh, of 2013, the EU directive, that it was written <coughs> to ensure the safety of the activities uh, related to onshore, uh, offshore oil and gas. And also in this uh, directive, there are also some uh, uh, actions to be taken in case of if an accident is happening. And then we support the European Union because the European Union is also working together with the authorities of the member states in this European Union offshore oil and gas authorities group. And then we are supporting from the secretarial, technical secretarial point of view this. This is a quite important work and the European Union is also quite uh, strongly involved in international collaboration also to make uh, those uh, standards very high. And at the end, uh, a bit uh, of our work looking into the future, we have a small amount of our research that is uh, dedicated really to look into an exploratory field. One of the things uh, also we have seen is uh, that uh, it is important that uh, we have renewable energy at our disposal. But one of the characteristics of this uh, renewable energy is uh, that the fact that you have not constantly this energy when uh, it is necessary. It is uh, an intermittent production. You would like to have uh, somewhere else uh, where the energy is produced uh, in another place. So we have launched a, <clears throat> a project which is uh, really an exploratory project in which uh, we look uh, practically to try to analyze and identify which are the challenges that are related really to the, both of the making up, so the engineering point of view and the geopolitical point of view of the possibility to put a grid crossing, a link in Europe and then North America where this energy is really transmitted and then of course crosses the Arctic. And with this, I thank for your attention. <laughs>